Hi, my name is Anne Bartholomew. I'm very pleased to be here today talking to Nelson DeMille about his newest thriller, The Panther. Nelson, welcome. Thank you. So your new thriller revisits John Corey and Kate Mayfield. Where are they now and when was the last time we saw them? What's, ha what's happening with them in this book? Well, this is the uh, sixth book in the series and uh, this book is set in Yemen. All the other books were set mostly in New York City. John and Kate are on the uh, Anti-Terrorist Task Force, which is FBI, NYPD, based on a real Joint Terrorist Task Force down at 26 Federal Plaza. So most of their adventures have been urban, but I wanted to get them out of the urban setting, because within the urban setting you have rules and regulations, FBI and Justice Department. I wanted to get them into uh, an exotic place and also a place with no law. So I picked Yemen, uh, because the Joint Terrorist Task Force does send people from New York to Yemen to investigate the coal bombing, USS coal bombing, October 2000. Uh, the time of the book is about four years later, it's about 2004. We saw them last about a year before that in a, uh, in a book called the, uh, the Lion, which was again New York City. But now they're in Yemen and I found it interesting to bring people out of Manhattan, out of their milieu, they're urban people and all of a sudden they're in, the, uh, they're in one of the most lawless countries in the world in a very, very hostile environment surrounded by hostile allies, the Yemenis are supposed to be our allies, mm -hmm. with a very small American contingent there who've been investigating the coal for about four years when this book takes place. How do they adapt to that change? Does it really shock them out of their, their comfort zone? I mean, what are they, what's their reaction to being kind of dropped in there? Uh, not a good reaction, <laughs> <laughs> which is part of the fun of the book. I mean, the book, John Corey's a funny character. His wife is kind of, she's not his straight man, but she keeps him straight. And uh, he complains. He's a little finicky. He's, mm -hmm. a, he's our superhero. He's a man's man, but he likes his creature comforts. And he finds himself in a country that doesn't serve alcohol. Mm -hmm. and this is one of his first problems. <laughs> but he knew this going in. Uh, but it, it, but it, it's, it's like every other book where, you know, somebody from uh, a Western country goes to an exotic locale, mm -hmm. whether it be, you know, a benevolent exotic locale or not, it's still not, it's not home. And you're not there for vacation, you're there to do a job, and you're trying to deal with another culture. At the same time, you're dealing with, you know, with a criminal investigation. Um, and it's challenging, but it's only it's, it's challenging for them, but I, hopefully it's, it's interesting to the reader. So how did you uh, prepare yourself to, f for you to go to Yemen? Like, what, did, what kind of research did you do to build their world and create a sense of authenticity in their, their like, experience there? Well, that's a good question. I was going to go to Yemen last January, but the, uh, the Arab Spring had just started, and uh, it was supposed to be February. I was going to go, uh, my wife didn't want me to go. It was dangerous even then. But it wasn't that dangerous, but uh, after they tried to blow up the president of Yemen, I thought maybe this is not a good idea. Uh, but thank God for uh, internet, thank God for Google, and <laughs> you can do all of this stuff now. With the, you know, I mean, you can't do it all, but you can do a lot of it. Um, on the internet, there was a time when you had books where you, where you interviewed people, and I did have a friend who was in the Joint Terrorist Task Force who went to Yemen and uh, was a coal investigator. And uh, one of my son's friends, a young man who speaks Arabic, although he's not, he's not, not Arab himself, went to Yemen to study the language, which is the most pure form of Arabic, and he was a language uh, scholar. And he spent three or four months there. So, you know, interview people. Mm -hmm. This is second best. You really you want to be there if you can. Right. You know, if the book is set in uh, Tahiti, you sure want to be there. <laughs> or Bermuda. For sure. Yeah, man, it's like, you're not quite sure you want to be there. But I would have gone. But it just really was, uh, was a wrong time. Mm -hmm. so. so we're going to see John Corey take a Tahitian vacation maybe in a couple I think years. I think the next <laughs> book is about him going to Tahiti. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be a good summer read. Right. <laughs> Your work has been uh, really focused on this very particular area in, uh, in American uh, military history, right? And so it started in some of your earlier novel novels in Vietnam, and like, you know, came out of your own experience there, but you've taken um, a really interesting sort of path you know, over the, um, the course of your career and over our you know, sort of contemporary history about you know, what America's role um, in that sort of international military scene has been. So what's been, what's been your vision for you know, bringing that space into your novels yeah. and how's it influenced you as a writer? Uh, well, that's a good question too. I mean, I was a political science history major in school, so you know, the interest was there to begin with. And I grew up uh, with the Cold War. And the Cold War was like part of everybody's life, part of my life. I loved the Cold War novels before I even started writing. 
And I wrote a few Cold War novels, not as many as I would have liked to. I thought, you know, when I wrote The Charm School, which was, it was a bestseller, I said, I, I think this is what I'm going to do. You know, I'm going to be like the American look how I, but what happened is the Cold War ended. All of a sudden it's over, <laughs> and it's like, and all these Cold War writers didn't know what to do. There were some military themes that I explored too. I went back to Vietnam with Upcountry. Um, but the war on terrorism was not, not, not an interest of mine. Um, but I created this character, John Corey, in, in, a, in a book called Plum Island. It was a standalone book. It wasn't meant to be a series. He was NYPD wounded, convalescing. He was about to be uh, retired with a medical disability. And, and, and I wrote the book, and it was published. And the fan mail was like incredible about John Corey, John Corey. Well, I've already got this guy retired. He's not, <laughs> what, can, what can we do with him? We need another job for the character. And somebody, a friend of mine who was this fellow at the Joint Terrorist Task Force said, we hire a lot of NYPD who are retired either medically or whatever, long as the medical disability is not that you know, severe. Have John Corey join the uh, Joint Terrorist Task Force and make him a federal agent. Because uh, we love the NYPD because they know the New, the New York City backwards and frontwards. So that's how Corey, it was really the character that drove the storyline mm -hmm. because, again, I didn't have that kind of interest in the war on terrorism in terms of uh, writing about it, but I had the character, he needed the job, and I didn't really want to make him like a uh, detective and he was retired mm -hmm. anyway. I didn't want to make him a private eye. It just seemed like a good, good solution. So I, now, you know, uh, this is my sixth book and it's about, you know, uh, global terrorism, which again, I had no particular interest in. But the reading public seems to have an interest mm. in it. And uh, does it replace the Cold War? I don't know. Uh, I think the Cold War was more interesting, <laughs> but you know, at least for a, for a, for a novelist, it mm. certainly was. Uh, That's certainly it's the war of our time. It's the war of our time. It's the war we have. You know, Vietnam was interesting, but people don't want to read about it, although I did two books. Um, and some good stuff came out of Vietnam in terms of literature. Uh, war on terrorism, I don't think it's produced the, uh, the same kind of books that um, that the war, uh, the Cold War produced. There was Black Sunday with Thomas Harris way back in the 70s, which was, you know, but he's a great writer and he was able to kind of capture this world of, you know, terrorism in an early stage, way back in the 70s when most people were only vaguely aware of it. Mm. Uh, but very little was done at that level anymore, um, except perhaps my own. So. Right. <laughs> and do you stay, I mean, have you found that you've become kind of a real, like, news junkie? Do you stay up on sort of, like, all the reporting that's happening? Yeah. And are you, like, kind of absorbing sort of the day-to-day, -day, like, if that... You do it unconsciously, yeah. unconsciously, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, uh, when, I, when I see the word Yemen any place in the newspaper, <laughs> I mean, yeah, two years ago I wouldn't have... I wouldn't even know where it, where it was, but yeah, all of a sudden, you know, you focus. Right. You, you start to focus on what you're writing about, but also just generally the war on terrorism. And I've read a few books and uh, a few nonfiction, and some good nonfiction mm -hmm. on, on terrorism. Um, and uh, I've seen a few movies, but there hasn't been many movies made mm. of, any real, of any real depth or, uh, or even um, any, any art nothing artistic has been made on, you know, the way we did with World War II and right. even Vietnam to some extent. Uh, it hasn't hasn't matured yet. Perhaps. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think we're, s we're still living so much of it. Yeah, it's too right. so close to right. recent memory. So that um, you know, the novel takes a an interesting role in that, and sort of being a really yeah. contemporary uh, lens, you know, for what's right. for what's happening. You know, with with a really great character. That's what the novel is supposed to do. I mean, you know, um, I probably learned more about World War II through uh, The Naked and the Dead, Norman Mailer. And I knew at least the war in the Pacific. I mean, mm. it just the whole thing came to me when this is what good, obviously, what good literature does. Um, and you name so many books from World War II. Uh, that's, you know, it, it, if the novelist has a role, that's the role, is to illuminate and to show, you know, the, the, the show the truth, but show it in another way, and especially show it from the standpoint of one or two characters. And I think somebody coming to it uh, who doesn't know the subject matter, I'm thinking of younger kids who are reading my books about Vietnam. Somebody was telling me that. Uh, so, uh, somebody I met is about 30 years old. He said his favorite book was The Charm School. The Charm School was written during the Cold War, and this guy was probably 10 years old. But the point is that the story is still there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know the Charm School is taught when they uh, in uh, college at college level uh, for uh, Cold War studies. So, yeah, the novel has a place, you know, as an adjunct, I think, to the nonfiction. And if you're, or you just read it for entertainment. Yeah. 
I kind of wanted to go back to the topic of location with you for a minute. I mean, you're, this this new novel, The Panther, takes you out of New York, and I think of you as such a such a great New York novelist. And um, what is uh, what is it that keeps you in the city and keeps you coming back? What do you what's its appeal well, for you? You know, I guess it's right about what you know. Hmm. Um, and uh, to the extent that uh, some of my books have been set, you know, in Vietnam, I did go back to Vietnam in '97 uh, to research. Uh, up country, um, and I, I kind of enjoy it. I kind of enjoy that. But I think the the New York book, the Long Island book, is maybe the fallback book. Mm -hmm. Where you're a little bit tired of the research, and you're a little bit tired of you know, traveling for the research or doing a lot of uh, internet research. You go back to what you know, and also the fans. You know, we live here, so we you know to us it's not particularly exotic. But we I try to see it from other people's standpoint. People are living in Nebraska or you know, reading a book set in New York and what we take for granted, like stopping in a corner bar doesn't maybe take <laughs> place in Nebraska. And uh, I get fan letters from all over all over the world, all over the country though. When I wrote Gold Coast, it was, you know, it was a Long Island book. It was a very, very specific, very small setting. Um, but it but it translated well west of the Hudson. Well, I guess people want to read uh, about uh, New York. So I, I feel comfortable with mm -hmm. it, although I certainly would change. Local. But some locales is hard to do. I, I, I wouldn't be, want to be a southern writer, mm -hmm. uh, a southern regional writer. You really got to know that world to right. do it. But if you go someplace totally different, like Yemen or, or Moscow, mm -hmm. I spent three weeks in Moscow and I was able to, I think, recreate uh, how it felt and how it sounded um, because perhaps not enough people around who could uh, sharpshoot me because not, <laughs> not that many people have been to Yemen or Moscow. Right. But you're looking at it, you're, you're, as novelists say, we're looking at a, a bigger truth. Right. Which means we don't really know what we're talking about, but we're going to make believe we do. And, right. And there is a bigger truth out there. And when you set a book in a locale, you're trying to capture it, but you don't have to. T it's really about people ultimately. Mm -hmm. So um, you don't want to go too wrong, but you don't want to you don't want to do a travelogue, which is a mistake that a lot of writers make when they do their research. Uh, Mitch Durr, uh used to publish his research notes, I think. Mm -hmm. But you can't always, and yet people who loved it, like I did, uh, didn't mind. But uh, I think the modern reader has so, many, so much access to other, you know, to that kind of information. Mm -hmm. They don't really need to know too much. So you can kind of skim over the, uh, the locale, as long as it feels right. Mm -hmm. Well, I am a big fan, and I'm really glad well, that you're here you. today and to talk to us about your new book. It's going to be a great hit. I hope so, so. Thank you. Thanks so much. Honey.